you a few tool tidbits uh, to take away from this um, presentation today. And, you know, it's unique when, when Andrew called me and asked me to speak about and working with our colleagues at the Economic Development Administration about, you know, rural housing specifically and regional and economic development strategies. I was very excited about the outreach for several reasons. One is because I think in the title of our federal agency, uh, that Department of Housing, which most people are familiar with, but you also think of urban development, unfortunately, um, you know, the urban development is also a misnomer in some sense. It is the broader community and economic development work we do, but we are the largest, HUD is the largest federal investor of um, housing and community and economic development resources in the federal government um, in rural places. We just don't advertise it very well and we don't market it very well of what we invest in, but we do invest more than USDA rural development in rural communities. So that's why I think the, the match for me to share today and to be able to offer you some, some thoughts and some tidbits hopefully will carry forward after you uh, you hear the presentation. So as Andrew had shared, you know, the economic development districts play a critical role in housing. And so today we have planners, we have land managers, we talked about the financiers and developers and others that are on the call. And I think that's why it's so critical to this discussion. And so here's just a brief kind of overview of what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to share a little bit about our role in, in rural communities, but I'm gonna dive deeper into that in the sense of what we're doing at HUD because this will help you to understand how coordination is so vitally important, not only within HUD, but in the White House and how that trickles down to our agencies and like HUD specifically. And then what rural resources do we have to help rural communities specifically? And then kind of wrap it all together about some uh, opportunities for both alignments with consolidated plans and with SEDs, and then some funding opportunities at the end. So I hope to cover all the speakers that are here, or all the, the people here today to have uh, something you can take away. So um, in the, the this when this new administration started um, in the Biden-Harris administration, they formed something called an Interagency Policy Council. And the Interagency Policy Council at the White House um, discussed how HUD and other federal agencies would come together to launch something called the Rural Partners Network, which is a place-based federal interagency effort to bring resources to rural communities um, in a kind of like all of, of a government approach. And so when that, when that approach came to HUD from the White House and our discussions with them, we decided at HUD that we need to have stronger coordination internally. And so we formed something called the Rural Prosperity Coordinating Council. And our deputy secretary wanted it to be mostly career staff so that it could carry over through all administrations and kind of be a legacy. So through that Rural Prosperity Coordinating Council, we have really kind of revamped and revised what we're doing at HUD for our rural strategy, which you'll hear about, and how as we're aligning these resources, how you can as well. In addition, um, we published in our annual performance plans, again, going to planning and, and key documents, this effort and this engagement, both in our fiscal year 23 plan of how we were going to engage with rural communities, but even in more detail in our current fiscal year 24 annual performance plan. And in our fiscal year 24 performance plan, you can see the details of what we're doing. And I'm going to cover that around that shortly and how this kind of aligns to this strategy of housing, especially in rural communities, but also um, in coordination and regional and local coordination strategies. Interestingly, in addition, um, every year when the budget passes, sometimes you dive into the appropriations law and you find tidbits of like, what do we need to do at HUD? And specifically, um, last year in the fiscal year 23 appropriations law, um, the Congress urged our department, HUD, to provide decent affordable housing and promote economic development, but also taking consideration how we're designing our programs and our challenges at the scale and scale of rural areas. So that's why we're also, because Congress is directing us as well to better coordinate how we're serving real, rural communities. So what we did is we brought together folks from across HUD. And so you can see here, here's a representation of the 15 plus departments, 15 offices at HUD, mostly career staff that came together that meet on a frequent basis to design and plan how we're gonna address rural communities. And why this is so important and why I'm sharing this is because you can see the wide diversity of organizations that are participating in, in HUD from our community planning and development to, to housing and equal opportunity to our public and Indian housing group to our faith-based group and just, you know, the healthy homes group. So how important it is that when we're addressing regional challenges, especially in rural communities, you need to bring this full approach together of resources um, to make sure that we are aligning them. 
And so we were actually charged with four key things to do and form focus area committees. One is to listen and learn from rural communities. One, which you'll find fascinating, is to define and analyze. So we looked back over 10 years of the various definitions of rural we've used at HUD and we continue to use. There is no standard definition used across the federal government for rural. So this provides both challenges for how grants are awarded, but also when we're trying to report on data of what we're investing in rural communities and how we do that work. And so that was a significant part of the work that we're doing. That final report um, should be published and available, uh, I would say next month. So stay tuned for March for us to be able to share more about that. And then coordinating with the rural prosperity, as I mentioned, the White House team, but what I'm gonna share a little bit around this rural partners network. And then finally, how are we aligning our technical assistance to provide technical assistance specifically to rural communities and around housing and broader community and economic development? And so we set out on a kind of like a three phase approach in 2022 till the current phase to look at how we're gonna assess and develop this, how we're gonna prioritize and milestone our activities and then institutionalize this work moving forward. And so what we've done is we've been able to successfully accomplish some key things around this work of moving forward through this institutionalized phase of what we uncovered during that period around coordination and alignment of resources within HUD for rural communities. And now we're in that really that phase of being able to offer or develop better resources and tools and what I'll share with you today. Um, in addition, you know, I think this is really kind of a significant research paper that came out. So um, because of these challenges with rural definitions, there's implications on each of those definitions around if you're looking for HUD assistance programs around housing or other service related programs. This was an article that was published um, in our Cityscape journal um, that was that talks about the differences in those approaches to definitions and how significant those definitions can have an impact specifically on rural funding. And so, you know, it's a good read for those of you. I didn't put the uh, the link on here, so I'll add it to uh, the, the slide deck. So next time um, when I share it with Andrew, it'll have that in there. Um, so going back to this Domestic Policy Council and this Rural Prosperity Interagency Policy Council. So one of the charges was this, was to take a look at rural prosperity and how can we advance equitable rural prosperity around this community capacity engagement and access to resources. And it started as something called Strike Force 2.0. It was kind of mirrored off of the Strike Force 1.0 back in the Obama Bi uh, Biden administration. And, um, and we came up with the name of the Rural Partners Network. And so if you hear that term frequently, this is this whole of government approach that's looking around these key areas of promoting equity, access, collaboration, which you're gonna hear a lot about, kind of developing local leaders, building trust, and then this long-term continuity in communities. And then what it's doing is pulling together at the leadership of both the White House and USDA rural development, getting people with federal program expertise to help navigate and advocate on behalf of rural communities so that we can increase and help with interagency collaboration at our federal level and how we're offering programs, but also create some best practices. Um, and I'll share some of those that are in process. Um, this unique approach actually for the first time, usually in place-based initiatives in the federal government, we usually have, you know, it's either we're working in a place and we call it place-based because we're offering help locally, or we have an initiative where we're designating neighborhoods. And so we're going to work on those specific neighborhoods. This, the uniqueness of this was it brought both together. So there's both a depth strategy where we're designating places to work and coordinate and help to leverage and learn. But we also have created this breadth strategy, which is what are we going to do to help all of the rural communities and rural places? Um, and so you'll see some of those challenges as we come up. Here's the pool. Here's the, the gamut in the cornucopia of all the federal agencies that are involved with this effort. And that list continues to grow. So you can see quite a lot of folks are involved. And one thing that we did do is set up a website called rural.gov to bring all of the real rural resources and the federal government together. And I'll share more about that shortly here, but that's on the breadth strategy. But in the depth strategy, we uh, uh, ended up having a set of communities that applied for and were designated based on some criteria to select where we were gonna deeper dive and help these communities. And so we had several of these communities designated on behalf of the White House and USDA, around 34 to 37, the reason why I'm fluctuating on that number is Alaska is a unique place because of the Alaska Native peoples and we have um, some fluctuating numbers of how we're combining certain areas or not, but the rest are pretty firm of what those community networks look like. And each one has a host entity or agency and a collection of partners with a defined geography that are working in those areas. 
kind of here's that list. So here's that list of all those places designated, whether they include a, a collection of counties or a city in a county or specifically one county. Um, when you get the slide deck, you can click on these and it has links to each of the profiles for these communities where we're engaged deeper. In addition, on rural.gov, you'll see a fact sheet, you'll see some frequently asked questions, and then, of course, it was covered heavily in the press, and we continue to see articles written about what we're doing in these neighborhoods across uh, rural communities to help um, get boost in funding to these communities. In addition, there's also um, some reports that you can look at that kind of dive deeper into what I'm sharing if you want to learn more. Um, that include, as I mentioned, the frequently asked questions, the fact sheet, but most importantly, I would go to rural.gov because on rural.gov, not only are there resources for all of the federal government that are specifically targeted to rural, but you can sign up for the listserv to get information. And by clicking on each agency, you can have um, access to those specific agencies, rural resources and where they're connecting their rural resources. And when you click on the HUD website, you'll find that you'll go to something called the HUD Exchange. So at HUD, we have two significant websites. One is HUD.gov. That's really kind of a static website to list our programs and what is currently available. But HUD Exchange is where we list our technical assistance and that page is fluid. It's constantly updated with new resources, new tools, new uh, information on case studies or webinars or trainings. Specifically on the HUD Exchange, there's a site that is our Rural Gateway. And the Rural Gateway is managed by our Office of Rural Housing and Economic Development, which we have at HUD. And Dr. Jackie Williams is the director and the founding director of that department. And on the HUD Exchange Rural Gateway, you'll see there are peer learning and resource sharing section. There is some case studies that are listed. There's also access to the upcoming webinars that are happening. And then finally, you have an opportunity to ask questions through one-on-one -on -one technical assistance and to get support for rural, either through clicking on the link um, to, to ask for specific questions or calling a number. So it's a way for us to work specifically with rural communities to align resources and provide those. You can sign up for a listserv as well for this so that you can get updates um, about what's happening in rural communities on the HUD Exchange. In addition, um, we have, have the last couple of years monthly meetings with the Depart U.S. Department of Rural Development, uh, sorry, the U.S. Department of Agriculture Rural Development around technical assistance partnerships. And so in May last year, we, we worked with them on a partnership and some recommendations for better aligning for our technical assistance. So I'll share with you some of what's been going on there as well. And part of this was looking at what we did back in 2016 and kind of updating those materials to develop a longer term strategy around this interagency coordination, even just between two federal agencies. Um, so what does that look like and where can you access some of those technical assistance programs if you're in a rural community, especially around this, these housing strategies that, I, that, that are so important? So unfortunately at HUD, most of our technical assistance, meaning, you know, like if we were giving consultative services or giving someone to help a community is limited to a HUD grantee. And many of rural communities, unfortunately, because of their size are probably not HUD grantees through our entitlement programs like community development block grant program or others. And so that becomes a challenge to get technical assistance to communities. We can offer our team members to go out and help, but we can't necessarily get hire someone to go help for longer term. But there are some unique TA programs that are non-dependent on you being a grantee to HUD. One that's really I wanted to share is our Distressed Cities and Persistent Poverty Technical Systems, because this one actually is limited to geographically to size of a community so that we are actually providing this to smaller local rural communities. And, and this program is, is, is on demand, meaning it's a rolling application process, um, but it's for communities under 50,000 and over, I think it's 500. So there is a, a floor and a ceiling. Um, but the benefits of participating in this are around that capacity building and a lot on the financial management and internal process, but I'm really looking at focusing here on the program capacity, which is how do you build local government and capacity in local communities for economic revitalization or recovering after a disaster or strategizing around housing and community development projects. So if a community and those are listening and want to access this, especially for these smaller communities that are in need of housing, I highly recommend um, looking at the website, 
the application questions, it's very short. There's an intake process to just get more information, but it's not a complicated and it's not a real in-depth application, but it is something that is highly competitive. And so there's constant uh, need to make sure we're getting distribution across the country. And we are looking for more rural communities. Here are some examples. So um, through that Distressed Cities Technical Assistance, um, there's work that's happening in York, Alabama, in Blythe, California. Interestingly, I helped put that application together in Blythe. And then you can see also in um, Puerto Rico. Um, and so just an example of Blythe, finding creative solutions for unhoused individuals and, and families in a, is challenging in many cities. With the help of DCTA, Blythe is strengthening these partnerships to coordinate homeless systems and caring communities. So you can see these three examples of what's being done. In addition, here's a few more in, in West Memphis, Arkansas, um, in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, and then also in um, Hannibal, Missouri. And you can see those same kind of efforts around housing. Home ownership is a common theme that we've used this technical assistance for. Um, let me go back. I went too fast here. Um, in addition, there's another technical assistance program that is separate from our others. So these are these two unique ones of distressed cities. And um, this one I'm gonna share with you is thriving communities. And you may have heard of thriving communities because it's a, another one of those broader federal interagency collaborations where different agencies are calling their technical assistance thriving communities. And HUD has a very specific focus on ours, which is helping state and local governments and tribes that are receiving a large money from infrastructure funding from you know, bipartisan infrastructure law or IRA. Um, and they also need help to unlock land for housing. So if there's a something that's being invested and we can help, this is where this TA comes in to offer rural communities help with their housing needs while they're also working on this broader infrastructure funding. And here's just some examples of how this TA can help. Um, you know, if there is a new transit line that's being built or a walking and biking trail, and there, as Andrea mentioned, there's concerns of anti-displacement, how could you develop strategies to help around that? Um, so these are just some examples of how we've leveraged or could be leveraging this TA program for rural communities, especially around housing. Um, these are the four key buckets. So it's around preservation, again, land utilization, regulatory reform, and then coordination. Again, that coordination word, word you're going to hear throughout. Um, and then I'm going to give you some examples. So here's in Salt Lake City, even though it's a larger city, but it's aligning uh, projects to support housing and community building in, in a portion of the city. This was in Syracuse. You can see it's a small neighborhood that we're picking here. And this was around a viaduct removal project that was being built and um, originally and, and displaced um, residents and businesses and how to help around that new housing development that will begin and revitalizing this, this area in Syracuse. Or I, this example I really like because it's in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. And this particular one, again, is looking at how to connect um, connect the, the bus rapid transit um, that's going to be built, but also developing um, the system for retrofitting the bus line, but also around this adoption of historic holistic planning around what's happening in the neighborhood that will result as the bus line is being um, implemented there. So next, and I'm getting close to the wrap up here, is how do you find federal funding? So uh, as I mentioned, both on the HUD.gov website and HUD Exchange, there's places. We just released this new tool. So it is on the HUD Exchange to find funding, specifically opportunities under the IRA and, B and BIL, and also HUD around housing and urban development as well, and upcoming opportunities. It's really this particular navigator, as there's many ones, are really focused on these areas of energy efficiency, renewables, resilience, and environmental justice, but it is a tool. As I mentioned, the Rural Partners Network website, also a good place. There is a, on the Rural Partners Network, there's actually a uh, link where you can actually search by and categorize by community and economic development programs that are aligned to rural communities and or have benefits for rural communities. And there's a variety of topic areas, of course, housing being one of them, but others you can see here. And you can search and find available resources that each agency across the government, federal government, are placing on this website so that you don't have to go to each one of ours to find those. Um, you'll also, if you subscribe to the newsletter, you'll get the blog posts and et cetera that might also announce kind of federal resources for rural communities, but also case studies 
of what's been happening so you can stay up to speed on what we're doing, especially around these uh, community networks. Um, the newsletter that goes out that you'll get has these kind of sections, so you'll see kind of what's been happening around this whole of government approach. Um, and then you can see here kind of a list of other resources that come out, including their annual report. The 23 annual report is in production. Um, and so um, through those monthly newsletters and through the annual report, you get more information. And so what I wanted to share about the annual report is it also includes where the priorities are for these communities. So these 37 networks that I talked to you about, they were all surveyed to say, what are your priorities as a collection of partners coming together? and what you want to support. And what we found was employment opportunities was number one, infrastructure was number two, and housing was number three. But these all work together, right? They are so have to be so coordinated. And that's why economic development and housing and rural communities, it's, it's, it can be so much a chicken and the egg from each side and how that's driven um, that it can create some very unique challenges. And so when you dive into this, you'll see some of those case studies, especially in rural communities around affordable housing, new construction. For example, in Fulton County, Kentucky, which I'll mention here in a, in a few moments, a deeper dive into that, but you'll see those integrated strategies that are necessary in rural communities, especially around housing and broader community and economic development. So I'm going to give you one example of this uh, to share out, and then I'll close out um, my session here. So um, specifically for the Rural Partners Network, the White House, because they know these communities have multiple priorities, they ask each community to identify one significant project or two, and they assign them to federal agencies to help these specific communities. So HUD right now are working on five key strategies. I'm only going to deep dive into one of these for you, but it just shows about that importance of regional and local collaboration, but beyond the housing and economic development, how that coordination is so important. So just to show the diversity of housing challenges that we saw in these areas in Eastern Kentucky, um, you know, they have been recovering from flooding and 1500 homes were destroyed because of the flooding. And so we are trying to assist them with how to recover from those homes destroyed. In the Western Kentucky, they have not a how and Fulton County, they haven't had a new home built in 18 years and they have 100 vacant lots that they want to redevelop and they need to build a housing, not only a housing uh, economy for people to develop, but how do they influence and get people to develop on that on the lots, but how do they find housing developers in that community. Down in southwest Georgia, in the 14 counties in southwest Georgia, they have a, a series of homes, single family homes, that are for seniors and the disabled that are deteriorating and they need to have them rehabilitated and preserved. Let me give you two more examples of our five, is in Puerto Rico and southwest Southwest Puerto Rico, it's a comprehensive view of looking at the disaster from the earthquake they had, um, not the hurricane, but the earthquake where they lost a substantial number of the population. And it's this broader housing economic development strategy to help them there. That particular community happens to be one that's getting our distressed cities, TA, that I've mentioned before. And then in the central portion of Wisconsin in Adams County, um, they also are having challenges with their housing in need of uh, housing for teachers because they are not able to secure and keep teachers in the community because there's not housing that's available. So what do we do? You know, we are do like you all do that are planners and assessors is we look and deep dive into these communities. We look at like, what's the data available? So we deep dive and created profiles by looking at data from persistent poverty, opportunity zones, social vulnerability index, um, distress communities index. And then we've been assessing what resources are on the ground. So what does HUD have? Where are HUD's equities? Like what housing do we have there? What CDBG funding do we have there? We looked at DOT funding. We looked at USDA and the Rural Development Multifamily Products so that we could then look at this in the context of what they need us to help. But this is just one example of one project that this community needs around affordable housing. These are the other priorities. So, you know, you can't ever look at housing as one specific area because they have broader needs in these neighborhoods, especially in rural communities on connectivity, healthcare, infrastructure, and economic diversification, including workforce development. But we're just offering support there, but we know we need to connect with all these other areas. And so these communities are bringing together this host of partners in Kentucky Highlands to work on all these because you can't do it alone. You have to do it with multiple multi-sector partners to help these communities. And even at HUD, we have to bring people across HUD. So we, these are our team members that we're engaged with, with USDA and HUD collectively to work in this community. 
again, we look at profiles. We're looking at the data that's there and analyzing it to figure out how we can help. Looking at policy map to see where we can find particular demographic data. Are there unique challenges even across the counties that we serve that are unique and different? And then this is hard to read, but this is diving into the housing. So we went and looked at like all the housing that's been invested by HUD or other federal agencies and what's there. Um, we have this tool called Card at HUD where we can deep dive and figure out which funding is in a community, which I think is significantly important to find. And then we also kind of mapped out other resources available. Here's just that summary kind of the whole list that we looked at. Um, and then we compare them. You know, we're comparing over time between things and finding out where those needs are around comprehensive planning. Lastly, I want to dive over to the last piece of my discussion here, which is consolidated planning with SEDS. So HUD partnered with the Economic Development Administration to look at how we could conduct and help you all out there that are doing strategic planning. And we realized that both HUD's consolidated planning process and the SEDS process have some areas where there could be strong collaboration and alignments. And so we wrote three documents, uh, one being the Streamlined Comprehensive Strategic Planning. One is two is, is on how you can reduce your administrative burden around these aligned strategies. And then the third is about increasing local and regional collaboration. So what are the benefits of this joint planning, especially with the SEDS and a con plan that can be for housing and, and economic development? As I shared, you can leverage resources, you can minimize duplication, you can make sure you're coordinating your approach and you can have a more comprehensive impact. In addition, like here's just a list um, and you can see on the website of like how SEDS and con plans align and why the importance of aligning these joint planning processes between what we do at HUD with consolidated plans and what can be funded by EDA through SEDS or funded locally for a SEDS. So you can see these key planning elements that are exactly the same between the two. Why not coordinate the two together? Um, in addition, you know, when you're acknowledging and leveraging these kind of noteworthy differences, you know, considering how funding flows from each agency is really important through this. And I'm not going to read through these. I'll give you a chance to look at that later. But I just wanted to share that's on one of those um, documents that I shared. In addition, considering the scope and scale of your plans, how you can look at those and kind of more details around that. And then finally, kind of when you're looking at this puzzle of like the timing and the time frame for how these strategies are happening, how you're engaging in both community and public participation, there's a lot of overlap between HUD and the SEDS and our con plans and SEDS. And so this just gives you a visualization, visualization again of that SEDS and consolidated plan with citizen and public consultation and how they're so aligned between the two other than like one area, there's perfect alignment between these two and why that's important to keep that going. Um, last piece, HUD funding. So this is a list of uh, open federal grants on, on, on grants.gov of what HUD has. As you all know, we don't have a budget. So most of these are fiscal year funding that are still out there. Until we get a fiscal year 24 budget, HUD's grants won't be released. But I did want to share that there's several new grants, even in fiscal year 23, that are really important that could be used for rural communities. And these are just a list of some of those new ones on green and resilient retrofit programs, on preserving the and, and closing the home ownership gap. Um, and we've also seen our PRO grant, which is Pathways to Removing Obstacles to Housing. And we're seeing people in rural communities applying for all these. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention our Choice uh, Neighborhoods Planning and Implementation Grants, specifically the planning grants, about because they really focus on these comprehensive strategies, not just housing, but it's around neighborhoods and people that include economic development strategies. This is just a list of past grants. So these, we don't know if they'll be offered again until we get a budget, but at least you can see that list there two pages of past grants, and that's it. I'm going to stop here and turn it back over to you, Andrew. And here's my contact information, but you'll all get this in this in the slide deck. Thanks. Yeah, thank, you. thank you so much, Eric. Just a wealth of information there, lots of great info uh, and resources that are available. Uh, you know, a lot of this is just about uh, connecting people with the resources that are already available. So uh, thanks again for all that um, information. And um, as I said in the chat, all the presentation, all the links will be live uh, on the NATO website uh, in just a few days after uh, the webinar today. So thanks again, Eric, and uh, we'll have some time for, for Q&A uh, after our breakout session. So uh, please go ahead and hold those questions till then. Um, so up next, we have uh, Rick Hunsaker. Uh, Rick is the Executive Director of Region 12 Council of Governments. Uh, he spent his entire career in regional development. 
uh, in regional government, and he began his post-college career as a regional planner. Uh, as director of the Council of Governments, he's also served as the executive director of three affiliate nonprofit corporations, uh, the Region 12 Development Corporation, the Council of Governments Housing Corporation, and the Region 12 Housing Corporation. Uh, he's also the contracted executive director for the Mid-Iowa Development Fund, uh, which is an EDA RLF that serves an additional seven counties. Uh, so Rick is also an active member of the Iowa Association of Councils of Governments and has served as both the chair and vice chair in past years. Uh, he's currently the NATO uh, first vice president and has been a member of the NATO board of directors since 2012 uh, and serves on uh, numerous NATO committees. Uh, he's also a member of the RPO America Council of Peers, which was another is another NATO uh, led initiative. So. Uh, Rick was going to run through some of the uh, great stuff that they've been able to do at Region 12 Councils of Government uh, around housing and hopefully give you all some ideas about uh, some ways that regional organizations and economic development districts can really uh, make an impact on their uh, local housing projects. So thank you, uh, Rick, and I'll go ahead and turn it over uh, to you now. All right. Thank you, Andrew. And and hopefully there are some things that we do that that may be helpful, but I know many of my colleagues out there from uh, following your progress and being at meetings have done uh, far more. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about some things. Here's a map in Iowa. You'll see we're located in the west central part of the state where the, the red portion of the state, there are 17 councils of governments in Iowa. Uh, central Iowa is in addition, it doesn't have a cog, but it does have an economic development district. This is our region. There are 56 cities and six counties, and then you'll see the grayed out portion are six cities and essentially an, an urban influence county around Des Moines, which are associate members of ours where we work. Just to give you some background of, of Region 12 so that you get a context for the type of agency we are, uh, there's 72,000 people approximately that live in our region. We've been slowly losing population as many rural areas have. Our largest city is 10,000. That is the city that you see laid out behind our building there. Uh, that's Carroll. We have another city that's around 8,000. Our smallest city is 50. Uh, as a COG, we are an instrumentality of government in Iowa code. We also happen to be a 501c3. Our board is made up of county supervisors or they appoint all of our members. And so much like the other districts out there organized like you would be. Uh, housing, the activities that we do within uh, the housing, the development, things I'll talk about are within the planning department. We have public transit, which is the reason our building is so big and that's our building in the picture. And local assistance are our two departments. Housing is within local assistance. They have four dedicated full-time staff and then there are several support staff, uh, including the admin department. So to give you an idea of how we got involved in housing, uh, we started over 30 years ago and we started out with the USDA HPG grant. I did that as the only staff member here. Uh, all of a sudden I was out inspecting houses and writing specs and putting together uh, loans for people and doing the loan servicing. And that's, we, it was a very small grant. It was uh, an opportunity that landed in our lap from USDA that asked us to apply for it and decided to go ahead and, and grab that ring at that time. Uh, that really developed into a lot of things, although along the way there were other uh, opportunities that we were able to, to deepen our understanding and our experience with housing. In 93, there was a major flood in the state and there was CDBG and FEMA money um, invested throughout the state of Iowa. Our very first housing uh, project was in 2000 when we decided we thought we should start doing that. The state started uh, a housing trust fund in 2003. And just notably, maybe some of you that have been in the business that long kind of saw the economic developers turn the table. For us, they always resisted housing as being economic development. That started to change in the mid 2000s, where in our regional meetings, they started to discuss housing being an issue for, as it related to workforce. We did our first multifamily project in 2018. and. Uh, started really with the end of, of CDBG rehabilitation, kind of as we knew it in the state, we started doing a lot more development that I'll talk about. These are just some current issues, again, to, to lay the groundwork of, of where uh, we find ourselves and, and the, what we have to work within. 
there's little new construction in our region outside of custom homes. So if you want to build an $800,000 home and you've got the money to do it, that's great. You don't have to worry about the appraisal because you're not taking a bank loan, but it's difficult to build anything beyond that. As with all rural areas, our housing stock is really old. We have some communities that haven't seen a new house in probably over 20 years. I'd say the majority of our housing stock in the region is is probably pre-1949, maybe even pre-World War II. We have few contractors, less and less contractors in the region, and even fewer developers. Uh, the appraisal gap is something that's real, it's something that we've experienced with our development projects where it costs us two and a quarter or 250 to build really a workforce house. And because there haven't been any new units built, it's not appraising out for even what we have in it. Uh, and that is a, that is why there's no housing being developed. There is a housing shortage in all income categories. So it doesn't matter if you're low income or if you're a doctor moving in, it's, a, it's very, very hard in, in our communities to be able to find adequate housing. Rental quality is really not ideal uh, and is an issue when you have landlords that will purchase homes. And of course, they're not putting a lot of investment into them to keep up the housing stock. It doesn't help the communities. It may help their pocketbook but uh, rental quality is not ideal. And then here, the as we all know, the not in my backyard, misinformation that's out there, what I will label uh, as empowered ignorance, which I, is really related to uh, all housing programs or section eight, and, and it's all X. And I know that, and when you try to work on housing issues uh, locally, it, it's difficult to overcome misinformation because people are empowered and really feel that that they know what they're talking about. So that's some of the groundwork. Today, uh, I will try to be quick, but I wanted to talk about our role uh, as a planner, as a grant writer, a local government resource, the resource to developers, uh, and then of course, developers ourselves. And then at the end, just some reflections I have about our role. So in planning, those of you that are COGS and planning districts, you do all of this, of course, and housing is in comprehensive plans. Perhaps you've done housing needs assessments. Uh, you work with communities on nuisance ordinances and then really the economic development tools that are also housing tools, tax abatement and TIF. The last thing here, the rural housing readiness assessment is not something that we do. It's something uh, that our state, uh, Iowa State University Extension has developed and deploys, but we do serve on those teams in our communities, and then we are an answer in helping those communities follow those plans. In grant writing, these are the types of things that we've at least been involved in in our region. CDBG was extremely important. We probably had 60% of our cities that got a citywide CDBG grant. Our state isn't investing CDBG that way anymore, uh, but we certainly got a lot of homes rehabilitated over the last 30 years. We have used the HOME program to do down payment assistance. We do have a, a housing trust fund in the region that we do control under one of our affiliate nonprofits. This is funded by the state of Iowa, subject to annual state appropriation and subject to us being able to raise the local match that's required. Uh, we have operated ourselves uh, through competitive applications through FHLB and USDA regional rehab programs. We have project specific programs such as, you know, uh, middle schools that have are now becoming housing units or uh, it may be uh, we helped a, a county redo their county home with FHOB and workforce housing tax credit I apologize for the acronym that is a state of Iowa tax credit that is not income based it's based upon the price of the housing and we've done uh, those types of projects we've had special opportunities come up that we're always looking for opportunities and try to jump on board uh, many of you may know that the IRP through USDA can now be eligible. Uh, you can make loans to housing developers, working capital loans. Uh, that's new in that program. And so we do have an IRP that was funded this year, and we have been loaning those funds to developers. And then, of course, writing for match from really anybody that will give us any money. So in support to government, again, not dissimilar from what a lot of you do. Uh, any of the plans that we've done in codification, the COGS in Iowa do have a model code that we've developed and that we update every year. And so we work with codes of ordinances and our communities and our state, they're required to update that every five years. We will host housing workshops. We work with them on zoning. 
We have done several cities where we've uh, gone and assisted with nuisance abatement from doing the inspections and citing individuals to helping cities through the process. We perform rental inspections if the cities wish us to do that. Uh, and of course, uh, housing trust fund grants and loans. We've had some cities that have had funds that they would like to invest in a certain housing project. We had a community that that it was fifteen or twenty thousand dollars they got back from a CDBG rehab project. We matched that dollar for dollar with our housing trust fund, and they did a furnace program for senior citizens that lived in their community. And then our revolving loan fund is open to governments as well. For developers, there is the RLF. We have helped several developers with grant writing, particularly with the home program uh, or with CDBG in second story housing because we do have an expertise there uh, and we've assisted them to try to get some additional housing into our communities. Uh, we will serve as local government liaison, working with our city councils in particular to help move projects forward and, and help them understand how a project might work and how uh, a developer might be a benefit to the community. We've served on the project team. We have helped developers with our housing trust fund. And then recently uh, we put together a database of lots or land that is eligible to be developed, either infill lots or uh, subdivisions at the edge of town that weren't fully filled out or perhaps even farm ground that would be available for a housing project. Put together that database so that you may be a developer that wants to do 10 houses in a neighborhood uh, of an urban community, but maybe we can entice you to come and do 10 houses that are within 15 miles of each other in numerous communities. And we just put that project together. So our single family housing development, uh, when we look at when we're going to put a development together, uh, we want to make sure that it's a need that isn't being addressed by anybody else. We don't need to be doing a project if somebody else will do it. What type of opportunity is out there? Does the city have a lot that they're willing to donate to us? Is there local cash available from a local foundation? Uh, are there partners there that will help us get the project together or will support us politically? Uh, what type of housing do we think is going to do best? Because we have to, you know, we're facing that appraisal gap. So is it a three bedroom or a two bedroom? Do we want to put a basement in or a crawl space? We're going to build a garage or not. What's our budget look like? Are we able, so far we've been able to uh, finance these development projects ourselves, but uh, the budget is an important piece of that. And where do we think we might be able to either leverage uh, some loan funds or some grant funds to be able to make the project happen? Of course, the potential appraisal and what that sale might look like. And we know that we may be behind on appraisal, but we want to make sure that we're not next to a junkyard and uh, surrounded by houses that appraise at $20,000 if we're going to put in a quarter of a million dollar house. And then just the, the capacity for risk, how, is, how supportive will our board be? And then organizationally, uh, just a gut check as whether or not we feel uh, we can undertake another project. How busy are we? How excited are we about this project? Does staff really want to to work in this community or build that type of housing? Uh, here are some examples of what we've done in single family housing. And again, I know many of you have done so many more projects than this, but our very first project uh, we did was um, just on a kind of a whim. It was an opportunity. We had the funds available. We had a contractor that didn't want to build. He didn't want to take the risk of doing it himself but he would be willing to build houses for us. And so we were able to pick two really, really nice lots near a high school in our second largest community. And uh, we had the, the funds available in our RLF. We sold these houses right away. We actually made money on both of these. This was in 2000. Uh, then we partnered with community colleges on a couple of projects. Uh, the first one we did was in 2007. This is just up the street from those other two houses. Uh, again, in Denison, uh, the community college had been building houses and selling them for individuals. They had contracted them up front. They didn't have anybody this year. So we became the person that bought the house from them. The school district got involved and actually ran the project for us. So we really just served as a financer. And again, we're learning as we go along. We're, you know, incrementally learning new skills. We actually made money on this one too, which the school district saw. So they never used us again and built their own houses. Uh, we then turned to Carroll, our, our uh, largest community. We worked with uh, the Des Moines Area Community College here. We had a developer that had five leftover lots. We paid $10,000 a piece for them. One of them wasn't really usable, so we split it between two others. We built one house a year for four years. 
uh, at the end of a subdivision. Uh, then we started more recently developing our own houses. And so in 2019, we uh, worked with a community that uh, had some infill lots available. We stick built a couple of homes. We installed two of the first Homes for Iowa houses, which is the prison built housing initiative here in the state. And uh, then we have been choosing to do duplexes when we needed to, because that, that tax credit in the state, uh, one of the things that we had to, we had to stick to a limit that we could have in, in construction cost for the homes. And when the single family homes got expensive, we built a duplex to keep that cap down on all of them. And so here are examples in Jefferson, that Homes for Iowa house, that's the number three house uh, in the state. The one that you see to the right in blue behind it was the very first house that was installed in the state in the Homes for Iowa program, which is a program we copied from the state of South Dakota, by the way. And then in Coon Rapids, this house we just finished and is on the market, another Homes for Iowa house. Here's examples of our duplexes. Uh, these both, uh, the one in Panora just was completed. The one in Mineral is getting close to being done. You'll see that it's the same design, wanted to save money. And so uh, we were able to work with an architect to give us that design. Then also uh, in housing development, we've done acquisition rehab. And while we did this under the Neighborhood Stabilization Program and a grant uh, in 2009, 2010, uh, most recently, we were able to receive some ARPA funds to do this. So we either had donated or purchased houses. We're right in the middle of doing this. We're trying to be picky about the house because even though we have $150,000 a house, it is expensive to rehab them. And so we need to make sure that the house isn't too far gone. Uh, here's examples of what we're working on. Now, the one in the upper left in Sherdan, that's actually a state funded program because working with Habitat for Humanity, we were able to convince the legislature that maybe they should put some state funds to this. That house was donated. The Coon Rapids house in the upper right was donated to us. Uh, I think with our budget for that house, we've got about 120,000 going into it. The two on the bottom, we're looking to close soon. Uh, but these are houses that otherwise would have gone into either the hand of a landlord who I think probably would have invested what we would and it would eventually be a lost housing unit. We're also going to turn these all into home ownership opportunities. We've also done uh, multifamily development in Wall Lake. Uh, the city provided us two lots. They happen to be right next to the grocery store, which unfortunately has closed. Uh, but in this case, we looked at, can we build senior housing? That's, they were interested in doing that. There was a waiting list locally. And the thing about senior housing in Iowa, if you have a loan that requires you to keep the rents low, you're tax exempt. And that's the only way we could make this project cash flow. So we really had to dig into and do our homework, dig into the pro formas up front to see what would work and talk to the city and said, you're going to give us these lots. These are not going to be taxable lots if we can make this work. They were fine with it because they wanted uh, the opportunity to have seniors live there so that it could free up other housing in their community. These were all stick built. We had to do a capital stack uh, that included a lot of different funding sources. We do still own and operate those as rental units. Did similar in Glidden. The city provided us lots. Uh, the only difference really was funding. We did not have home money in that in Glidden because uh, we got a significant local uh, foundation to provide us funding and a bank gave us a really good deal. So here's an example of what those look like. In Wall Lake, we built a triplex and a duplex. And in Glidden, uh, you have two different duplexes. Notable, we did win the Iowa Housing Award in 2020 for the project that we did in Wall Lake. And that project in uh, Glidden, that top one, is the one that the state is using as an example of multifamily housing uh, for their uh, workforce housing tax credit program. So, of course, developer, we have several different concerns, as you can imagine. Either those that have done this or if you're thinking about doing it, there certainly is a risk. Uh, that we can lose money or that something else could go wrong and will we lose board support or political support. Many of these we serve as the general contractor and that is something that requires a specific talent. Finding contractors to be our subs has, is, has been a concern so far we've been successful. The appraisal gap that I mentioned is a big concern. Uh, do we get a realtor? Because if we're already going to be behind, realtor is probably going to charge us, you know, 
another five or 6% to sell the house. In some cases, we have had local realtors who understood that if we're putting houses in their market, that's a house they can sell later. And they've been very generous with um, really decreasing the fees in order to sell them. But we've also done a lot of them as for sale by owner. There's always going to be unforeseen costs. You're going to have old concrete. You're going to have trees that you have to remove that you didn't think you were going to have to. You're going to have a snowstorm that's going to fill up your foundation that you have to pay $1,500 to clean uh, the snow out of. All kinds of things are going to go wrong, and they just are. That's what's going to happen as a developer, uh, but it is a concern. And then client affordability, uh, because if we are going to fund any of these with, say, CDBG or home or FHLB, then you're going to have to sell it to somebody that's income eligible. That's hard to do if your house is two and a quarter or two fifty, at least in our region, with where those individuals, uh, where those incomes fall. And then, of course, you have carrying costs. It's maintenance. It's mowing the lawn. It's paying the utilities. Uh, it's insurance. And then you may have certain regulations that are going to increase the cost of your project beyond what you might have thought. In Iowa, we have a huge radon problem. And so, if we test for radon and need to install a system, that's another fifteen hundred dollars. So some reflections uh, that I have as a developer, you really have to have board support. As you can imagine, they have to be on board. Our board's been great. They've seen it transform neighborhoods and they've been very supportive of our housing activities. You need to make sure that you're giving due time to each activity. You can't uh, have any shortcuts. And as far as capacity is, you know, you can learn capacity, you can copy it from other people, which we have generously done uh, in the last three decades. You can hire in, which we've also hired in uh, capacity, and then it could just be believed. You can just tell yourself you're going to do it and that you'll figure it out uh, as, as time goes on. And we've done that, too. You want to make sure that you leverage your partners. And I know that this is elementary, but use the banks, use your economic development organizations, your elected officials, talk to local foundations. Uh, leverage your network, go to NATO meetings, and don't be afraid to ask your colleagues questions, work through your state association, uh, state housing advocacy groups, but you do have to dedicate yourself to the task, and you should expect problems. There are going to be unforeseen costs, there's going to be roadblocks, there's going to be appraisal issues, but always look for opportunity. Uh, be willing to, to think broadly about how you can benefit the region and how you might be able to undertake housing uh, in a way that maybe you didn't even think was possible. Uh, you may or may not need to create a separate nonprofit. Uh, I have a colleague in the state who really wants to empower a nonprofit and run through the nonprofit. We did that too. We've got one that would uh, qualify to be a CHOTO, but we haven't needed to access funds that way yet. So we've, been, we've just used the COG as our organization. So in summary, um, you know, know and plan for the risks, understand what your financial costs could be, understand what your staffing commitments are going to be and, and politically uh, what, uh, what benefits and, and what costs there might be. We've done a lot, not as much as some of the rest of you, but we are a very small cog. That was my purpose of, of talking about who we were in the beginning and had no experience when we started. I mean, it was me. I knew nothing. I was I had an MPA. My father was an electrician, but that's about all I knew about construction. And, and I didn't know a whole lot about that. We had zero experience and we had no money. We had no money in the bank when we started and we were able to do it through through uh, just hard work and wanting to make sure that we could serve the region. We were able to, over the course of three decades, build a program. You want to make sure that you dedicate adequate resources to it. Make sure you have the right people in place. Uh, know your legal landscape. Uh, everything, like I talked about, that senior project, knowing what we could do with uh, property tax to do you have to have an MLS registration if you're going to make loans. Uh, in Iowa, as a government, you don't need to have that. But you, if you operate as a nonprofit uh, or in other states, you may need to do that. And of course, there's no one recipe for success. There's lots and lots and lots of programs out there and lots of people and lots of ways to do it. And then really, if you fail, we, which we have failed several times, there's been things that haven't worked out. It's a learning experience because in the end, we wanna make sure we can serve the region. We wanna make sure that we provide adequate housing uh, for people. So that is, that's it. Hopefully I didn't take too much time, Andrew, but, um, I appreciate the opportunity and we'll be